Hi everybody, I'm uh, Mordechai Guri from uh, Ben Gurion University in Israel. Um, I'm currently doing my PhD under the, under the supervision of uh, Professor Yuval Alovich. Me and my colleague, Israel Mirsky, are going to present GSMAM, a method of leaking data from air gap computers. So let's talk a little bit about the background of the problem. What exactly is uh, a, a, an air gap? ERGAP means that a single computer or a network of computers are physically isolated from the internet or from other less secure networks. This measure has uh, two main goals. The first, to uh, prevent outsiders from uh, a breach into the uh, ERGAP network, from attacking the ERGAP network. And second, prevent insiders from uh, leak information outside of the ERGAP networks. Airgap networks are, uh, uh, exist in military and defense system, critical, critical infrastructures, uh, medical equipment, and finance, finance, and so on. Let's talk about the attack scenario. We have two assumptions in, uh, in our attack scenario. First, we assume that the malware already installed or present in the Airgap network. Um, as published, Airgap network can be breached, for example, by uh, infected USB keys, uh, deceived insiders, malicious insiders, supply chain attack. At the end of the day, we assume that somehow a malware entered into the, into the air gap uh, uh, network. Two, we assume that at some point, the attacker or the malware want to exfiltrate or to leak data from the air gap network to the, back to the attacker. So uh, some previous work in, uh, in this field. Uh, the first, for, first work was uh, show how the attacker can, can, exist, uh, can create a network between two air gap computers using uh, ultrasonic method. The attacker can establish network between two computers using the speaker and microphone to communicate over the high frequency inaudible sound. In this case, the maximum distance is about 20 meters. Uh, in our work, we un last year we introduced AirOper, which demonstrates how the data can be exfiltrated from AirGap computers over FM radio signals, which gen generated from computer monitor cable. Uh, we show how the um, uh, exfiltrated FM radio can modulate information from the computer and transfer transmit it to a nearby smartphone with FM receiver. Finally, uh, we, in the, in the uh, last CSF uh, conference, we, demo, we show Beast Whisper. Beast Whisper established two-way communication channel between two closed air gap computer by using thermal manipulation, uh, by emitting and sensing heat signals, two computers can communicate between themselves by what we, saw, what we called a uh, thermal ping. <clears throat> so first, I'd like to give a high-level technical overview of GSMM. Later on, we will talk in more details. So general, generally, every computer has a bus which connects between the CPU and the main, main memory. We observe that the bus emits electromagnetic signals. We also observed that part of the emission fall out in the frequency range of GSM, UMTS, and LTE cellular standards, which mean 2G, 3G, and 4G networks. This emission by, by itself is not strong enough, was weak. We found that by using specialized CPU instructions and by utilizing the multi-channel memory architecture, which exist in most of the computers today, the emission power can be controlled and amplified. In this way, what we actually do is convert a stand standard desktop PC into small transmitting cellular antenna by using only software. Okay, once we have this cellular antenna in our end, we can, we can use it to transmit data into nearby receivers. These receivers can be, for example, smartphone that uh, uh, bought into the, uh, 
uh, the area of the air gap computer. It can be also low end so called feature phone that have no cellular, uh, have, have no Wi Fi, Bluetooth, and uh, other receiving capabilities. Usually, this kind of phone are allowed into the, uh, some kind of restricted or sensitive area. And finally, we can use a dedicated hardware with antenna as a receiver. In this paper, in our work, we focused on the case of low-end feature phone and uh, um, about the intended receiver, uh, USRP, uh, uh, with antenna. Now, let's see some demonstration. As you can see, the right computer is isolated, air computer, no network, no internet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, ordinary isolated computer. This is a low-end feature phone, 10 years old, uh, no SIM, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth camera, uh, plan only voice call mobile phone. Now, the super secret code is typed into the computer into AirGuff computer. And the feature phone, which infected with rootkit, after you'll see, are able to receive the signals emitted over the cellular networks. Thank you. Um, so now that uh, you've seen a bit of the overview of how GSMAM works, uh, I'd like to go into a bit more technical details, uh, starting with the transmitter. So as Motin pointed out, uh, basically the transmitter, or should we say what the main point where the radio waves are coming out, is the CPU memory configuration. And um, what I'd like to point out is that, uh, well, first of all, how do antennas work? Let's just a quick overview. So antennas uh, emit radio waves uh, by oscillating a current through their terminals. And uh, radio waves are ca characterized by two, uh, two ideas. One is their oscillation in hertz, and two is their amplitude or their strength, usually measured in dBm. So how can we get the computer to act as a uh, more basically a cellular uh, transmission station? emitting uh, energy on those frequencies. So we had two main observations, like Moti pointed out. First of all, a large CPU RAM transfer um, causes a buildup of current on the configuration, and that emits a amount of uh, uh, RF radiation uh, on across a band. Uh, and like Moti pointed out, um, uh, what's important, what's imperative in order for this uh, emission to occur we need to bypass the cache that's in the uh, CPU, because otherwise, the moment you try sending a lot of information to the memory, uh, the buildup won't be consistent, and you won't see the signal. So we use uh, from the SIMD instruction set found on AMD and Intel uh, architectures. We use these instruction sets to send a lot of information to the memory, and uh, therefore, build up, therefore build up a significant signal. The second observation is that uh, the motherboards usually run at about a clock of about 800 megahertz which is uh, coincidentally the range of, uh, t uh, in the range of cellular uh, frequency bands. And if you see down below here, uh, we show a plot in, I don't know if you can see the color so well, but you have uh, in blue is the noise floor. That's basically what uh, we're seeing, uh, the RM tr RF transmissions from computer operating regularly. And the, the red is the, uh, the amount of energy we receive across the spectrum when uh, we send a large transfer by bypassing the cache. And uh, if we highlight here where the uh, uh, tech cellular technologies operate, we can see that LTE, GSM, and UMTS uh, all fall on these ranges. And therefore, it's possible, not just GSM, but it's possible to uh, receive these signals on other cellular technologies as well. OK, let's talk about how we send the bits or the modulation. So we use a very simple uh, modulation scheme. We use BASK, binary amplitude shift keying. At the send to zero, we basically do nothing for uh, two seconds. And this is how it looks like on the, in the frequency range. Uh, this is, again, this is the random noise that's coming out of the uh, computer. And it's, you can imagine it moving around a bit. And in order to send to one, we raise the amplitude for T seconds.
OK, so what if we have to send, of course, more than one bit? So we do a process called bit framing. Uh, and the process is essentially uh, common in uh, networking where we attach to the, uh, a payload a header, in this case, a preamble of 1010. And if we have a payload that's larger than 12 bits, let's say a megabyte or larger, we sequentially transmit these payloads, each with uh, their header. And the header has uh, an important uh, usage. First of all, uh, we use the header to, uh, for the receiver to detect transmissions. In other words, if, if it sees the deterministic 101, then it knows that there's a transmission involved, especially if it's repeating. Secondly, uh, we use it for synchronization in order to know what the T value is, how long a bit is, and when to sample it. And uh, we use it to select the threshold. Now, we use a very simple way to demodulate this information. Uh, when the receiver receives a signal, uh, if it's above a certain threshold, we, we, it reads it as a 1. If it's below a certain threshold, it reads it as a 0. So in order to determine what this threshold is, it can take a look at the preamble and uh, set it accordingly. And we use that actually to dynamically update the threshold as uh, the mobile moves closer or further away from the device, from the transmitter. So a few uh, interesting and important characteristics about the transmitter. First of all, this transmission rootkit only really uses uh, four kilobytes of memory because we're transferring a lot of information, but we're transferring it over to a very specific spot of memory, a very small area of memory. And therefore, if you look at the amount of memory usage, it'll, it'll be only about uh, four kilobytes. Uh, if you would want to actually try and detect, you would have to look at the amount of uh, memory, amount of information that's being uh, sent to the memory. Uh, no root or admin uh, privileges are required, and we don't use any APIs. It affects Intel and AMD architectures, and it uh, works on Windows and Linux and other operating systems because, of course, it's, this phenomenon is hardware-based. Now let's move on to talk about a little bit about the uh, receivers. Uh, so about modifying phones. So every phone comes with a, a baseband processor. It's a dedicated chip that uh, is responsible for sending and receiving RF frequencies and managing the communication. And this chip is completely separated from the uh, CPU. In other words, the uh, chip that runs the uh, operating system. So for example, the uh, Android operating system. So it's not possible to uh, try send commands to the baseband component to ask it to, let's say, sample a certain frequency. It's pretty much blocked from the operating system. Uh, and all firmware uh, of common brands are, are closed, closed source, which means that basically uh, for the common person, it would be actually quite difficult to install the receiver uh, uh, rootkit onto cellular devices. However, this won't deter highly motivated and resourceful threats as we've seen in the past. So how did we modify the firmware? So we used a, an open source GSM baseband software uh, called Osmocom BB. And we put it on a, a rather old phone, a Motorola C123, uh, to show that it, uh, not only the uh, feasibility, but also that, uh, like Moti mentioned, that uh, still in a lot of large corporations, you're allowed to bring these featureless phones into pro uh, restricted areas. And to show that this is still a, a threat. And we note that although uh, GSM, uh, we implemented it on a nine-year-old phone, uh, when you implement it on a more sophisticated or more, uh, more advanced uh, architectures, you can actually get much uh, higher bit rates and a much better quality, as, we, as we'll see when we get to the evaluation. And that's also why we checked it on the, uh, the USRP uh, RF kit to show the, the kit that it's possible to receive these uh, signals uh, much further than the, our uh, prototype. And briefly, let's talk about uh, getting the bits. So uh, like I mentioned before, it's a very simplistic approach. First, we uh, have the device look, uh, listen at, uh, across this, the spectrum and try and find a frequency that's the least noisy. And in our case, we just looked at the frequency that's oscillating the least. And then when the, the uh, receiver looks for the, the preamble, and if it finds a preamble, it extracts the 12-bit payload. And uh, in the and at the bottom, you can see uh, two figures. Uh, the first is the frequency domain. That basically, sh again, shows you the difference in the energy received on, the, uh, on that frequency. And the time domain, this is basically what it'll look like if you're looking at that frequency. First, uh, for example, at a 1, there's a significant uh, rise in the amplitude. And if it's uh, a 0, then it's basically at the noise floor. 
So onto the evaluation. Okay, so um, to try and test every possible scenario that uh, would be common in a regular office workplace, we checked about uh, three different uh, desktop configurations, each with different architectures and different uh, memory configurations. Uh, we also tested uh, what the, to see the difference between uh, dual channel or D DDR2 and DDR3 memory and different clock speeds. And the receivers, as we mentioned, is the U we use the USRP B210 and the Motorola C123. So uh, amplitude, uh, here uh, we're looking at uh, the amplitude signal levels between uh, a zero and a one, uh, specifically with the uh, Motorola C123. And uh, we actually got a, a distance about 170 centimeters. We got a pretty quite decent signal, which is about the distance if, if you would put uh, your phone on, the, on a desk next to the computer or if you were in the close proximity. As for uh, uh, here, we're looking at the delta, in other words, the, uh, the difference between the zero and one. And we're looking at the, uh, the impact of different memory architectures, where we're looking at the uh, quad channel or dual channel and the different clock speeds. And we found uh, two interesting observations. Uh, first off, uh, uh, we found that more channels, in other words, uh, DDR3 as opposed to DDR2, provides us uh, a better signal strength. And the higher clock also provides a better signal strength. And it's, un it's understandable why more channels gives a better signal strength. It's because we're transmitting more current a larger, over a larger, or wider bus. And uh, the higher clock, we believe that's because uh, when, we trans when the configuration is operating at those frequencies, the noise floor is lower. And therefore, you'll get a better signal. And so with this trend, we can actually expect that as uh, memory improves, that this will be a, a bigger issue and the distance, uh, the reception distance will uh, get further. And now uh, here we're looking at the, uh, the uh, USRP. Here in the USRP, we could see that uh, we get actually a quite nice signal up to even 40 meters away uh, and even further. Uh, we were actually testing it uh, in the uh, office scenario, so we couldn't we didn't, that's why the plot only goes up to 40 meters. But it's, as you can see, that uh, uh, if you're using some sort of uh, not just a low-end uh, you know, uh, rootkit on an uh, old phone, if you're using, uh, let's say, somehow you got into a smartphone or you got into uh, another device who actually has uh, quite significantly uh, better technology or uh, DSP technologies, you can actually get a, a significant uh, boost in the distance. Okay, and the last thing we, uh, we looked at was the effect of different chassis. Uh, and then again, we're talking about the, the transmitter is a desktop computer. So the different chassis and uh, as well as the different orientations of the, trans of the receiver with respect to the chassis. And we, as you can see here that uh, uh, with respect uh, to the first figure here is we're actually we're receiving from the back end of the computer. And with uh, two different computers here, you get a very different uh, distribution of the signal quality as you go further away from the computer. So it really, again, it really matters what uh, uh, the, the shape and the build of the computer. And uh, the second figure shows you uh, basically a radius of where we get an SNR, a signal noise ratio of about a half a dB around each of these computers are also as well different. Um, so basically what you can take away from this is that uh, you can't get a deter you can't deterministically know uh, what kind of signal quality you're going to get from uh, the transmitter, but uh, you will get some sort of minimum. And especially if you don't use uh, like a, a lower end technology like the C123, if you use the uh, motor, if you use the USRP, uh, then you or a higher end technology, you can get much better quality. Now let's talk a bit about the bit rates. Um, this table shows the uh, transfer speeds for uh, different uh, data items. Uh, here, the uh, the Motorola 123 is uh, here. We're, tra uh, we're transmitting to the Motorola 123 at a uh, um, at a about one bit every one and a half seconds, and the USRP we're sending it at about a thousand bits per second. And uh, as you can see, we get, with, especially with the USRP, we get, you can send quite a significant amount of information in a short period of time. And as for the bit error rate, uh, specifically looking at the uh, old Motorola, um, you, we get about a 6% error rate, uh, which is correctable if you use uh, forward error correction and other methods. 
So to conclude, um, it's feasible to get uh, data out of an air gap network. Uh, electromagnetic radiation uh, or exploited from the memory bus can be used to carry this information. And uh, mobile devices can receive this information, meaning that uh, it can inconspicuously, you can bring in uh, uh, a device into a restricted area and uh, therefore receive uh, such information. And a few notes, uh, like we mentioned before, corporate, some corporations still have in their policy to bring simple GSM phones into these restricted areas, which means that it's time for some policy changes. Uh, the, again, GSMM doesn't just apply to GSM, also to LTE and other technologies. And uh, GSMM is not only relevant to the, the case of air gap networks, it could also apply to other scenarios. Thank you. Uh, Rudy Maseko, Software Engineering Institute. Um, given that the transmission power, I'm assuming, is rather limited, um, would uh, wall gapping work here? What, what uh, sort of mediations, other than uh, changing the structure, perhaps, of the computer to isolate these emanations, uh, would be effective? Uh, you're referring to the setup of the computer and the office scenario? Uh, yeah, I'm just curious because the it seems that the the power transmitted is probably very low. Yes. So maybe it might not make it through a wall, for instance. I was just curious if you uh, examined that at all. Uh, if I, I, I believe so. I mean, I I didn't do the actual test, but I think we did test. We did. We definitely checked it within an office scenario. Uh, through a wall, yeah, I don't think you're going to get necessarily, I mean, like where we work, we have like thick oh, yeah. concrete oh, walls, <laughs> so it's kind of like a bunker there. But if you had the reasonable walls, let's say, let's say um, uh, drywall, it probably could go through, especially if you're using the USRP, I think you could get uh, definitely much further than you would with the regular mobile phone. But we didn't, uh, we did not check how many walls we can get through per se. We were primarily checking uh, within office scenarios, let's say if a user comes within about uh, uh, 10 meters or so of uh, the office, let's say if the, the computer's in the other room, the door is maybe open or something like that. Thank you. Uh, Yong De Kim from Kaist. Uh, two questions. It, other like base stations, GSM base stations would interfere, other like GSM signals would interfere with the communication? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and that's part of the noise that you, you saw on the, one, of the si uh, one of the slides. We saw without transmitting at all, you see quite a bit of noise across these frequencies, and that's because we are, we're actually picking up the energy from different base stations. So if you were, let's say, in a completely enclosed environment, then the signal would be even better. Okay. The second question, uh, did you think about the reverse scenario where you can inject signal to memory bus from the GSM? Um, not in this What's work, we happen? haven't. <laughs> all right, thank you. Regarding your first question, I ju just want to mention, we didn't mention it here, but it was in the paper, that in, at the beginning of the phase, we are scanning the range for the best, you know, best, best reception where there is no, uh, 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 there is no uh, transmission for other neighboring cells. So we are finding the, the most quiet uh, uh, a band to transmit and receive. Have you looked to see what other frequency ranges your trick can operate on for broadcasting? So uh, we did look at, for the most part, of how far this energy, I mean, it's not a very good antenna. It's a very rough antenna. And because, uh, like we mentioned, the, the, because of the clock of the motherboard, uh, most of the energy falls at around 800 megahertz. But it goes about 200 megahertz in either direction. So that's pretty much the range you're going to get the signal, perhaps a bit more. Uh, but that was the range that we focused on. Um, you explored uh, uh, PCs uh, in the workplace. Have you uh, looked into laptops and how this might work on those? We, we investigated specifically actually just the motherboard itself. So that includes laptops, includes any, basically pretty much any computer that has a CPU of Intel uh, or possibly also AMD and other uh, uh, architectures, and of course memory. So it applies to many, many devices. Thank you. 
wondering about the enclosure. You know, mm -hmm. does a laptop pro uh, provide uh, any more lightweight temp tempest or something? Yeah, well, we didn't, we didn't check, uh, per se, from a laptop specifically what kind of signal we would receive. Uh, like again, we, we checked uh, at least three different uh, different cases, small ATX, you know, large, different uh, shapes and sizes, and they did have an impact, but uh, regardless, we were still able to receive a signal. Any more questions? Come on, let's thank our speakers. Thank you.